Hey guys, what's up? It is week 357. Four Pack was nice enough to send me over uh, one of their packages to open. Uh, I'm going to open it up and then maybe in the next couple weeks, anything I haven't seen, I will review and talk about. If I have seen them, we're basically just going to talk about them right when I open them. There'll be a link below and everything like that. Let's make sure I open this thing on the camera. Should have probably got a knife, but when you're an ogre, that's what you do. Here we go. Ooh, double wrapped course safety first so we got four blu-rays here let's see what we got first up is titan which is an excellent movie from a couple years back french movie directed by the director of raw this is an uh, amazing movie uh, i would really recommend it very interesting it's an art film art horror film so if you haven't seen it um then make sure it's your thing but i really enjoyed it really quite loved it great performances very bizarre and then we have Wormwood Apocalypse. Now this is the sequel. I've actually never seen um, this one. I've seen the original and enjoyed it quite a bit. Aussie zombie film. I heard this one's pretty good. Picks up right where the first one left off. So two for two, really. These are both two cool products that they put in there. And then we have Rave, which looks like an Epic Pictures uh, horror pack exclusive. I've not seen this one. Feel it spread. Um, yeah, definitely check this one out and maybe Wormwood too. Uh, yeah, very cool stuff here. Rave. Yeah. Not, not seen this one. Scream Team releasing, so I'll check that one out. And then last is a Cronenberg film, David Cronenberg, and this is Crimes of the Future, the one that came out a couple years back, maybe last year. Now, I didn't love this, but I did find it interesting. I did find the performances pretty stellar. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to rewatch this one, give it another chance. Um, yeah, I'm glad to have this one because I didn't have this Blu-ray. But um, the original one from 1970 did has nothing to do with this one. So um, it's definitely an idea movie, more so on that. And Cronenberg is great with ideas, kind of going back to his early days. I'll have to rewatch this and give it a shot. So, yeah, if you're interested, the horror pack, four titles right here, all pretty good stuff, honestly. I've seen two of them, and uh, the other two I'm interested in. So, yeah, great stuff, and I guess we're going to hop into the reviews. First up is going to be 2001 or two. I always get 2002. This was actually directed by the director of Nizakata, and he directed Ring as well, Ringu, from a couple years previous, 99, 98. I think it's 98. And this is Dark Water. This is the 4K that Arrow just put out. Now, Dark Water, uh, of course, is one of the Japanese movies that started the big kind of ghost boom. You have The Grudge, you have The Ring, you have Dark Water, you have Pulse, you have One Missed Call. In fact, all the ones I've seen there, for funny enough, the only one I haven't seen is The Grudge, which is the second most popular but all the other ones i've quite enjoyed i've quite uh thought they were all really great and they they grow as you watch them more dark water dark water is no different so looking in 4k it looked great it's a very rainy kind of sad movie we have a couple going through kind of a, a custody dispute over a young daughter she's adorable you feel bad for her. And what happens is the mother is struggling. She's struggling to find a place to live. She has to do it quick as possible so she can have a better chance of getting custody of her kid. They kind of hint that maybe she had a mental breakdown years ago. And basically the only place that she can stay at is this big high-rise kind of hotel. It's been run down. It's outdated. And everything leaks. Everything, everything leaks. There's a water tower on top of the building that, uh, you know, is just a little very suspicious, to be honest. Reminds me of the Black Dahlia murders. Is that is that where they found that body, if I'm not mistaken, in the water tower? That's a big hint. But anybody that's looking up at the 4K of a movie that is 22 years old, you should know Dark Water a bit. So essentially, the daughter and mother move into this, and weird things start to happen. There's a, there's a Hello Kitty backpack that keeps appearing, and everybody in the compound or the hotel... I'm at the, basically the apartment complex. Doesn't really want to say anything about it. It's very subtle. One of the guys who works there kind of notices it and just kind of wanders off from the area, refusing to talk about it. Other people get involved. There's there's times with the husband and, and you really genuinely start to care about this mother and daughter and it gets really creepy. It gets really tragic. And this is, the, you know, the two different kind of ghost stories that you can have. You can have the violent, angry ghost or you can have the tragic, misunderstood ghost. Now, what this director did really well with a ring was you think it's a tragic, misunderstood ghosts but it, it's both and you're just like oh shit um now dark water the ghost is dangerous um but 
you kind of feel a, a bit of sympathy for the ghost, which adds a layer here. It's just such a sad movie with all these different sad characters in here. The sad mother, sad daughter, sad ghost. It's just so freaking sad. Obviously so sad that it never stops raining. Water is constantly coming down outside. It's constantly leaking through the hotel and uh, the, the apartment and just drenching everything. This movie is wet. The aesthetic is great. The atmosphere is thick. But what puts this movie over from being a good ghost story into an excellent drama it's the the last act it's almost like an epilogue you don't even know you don't even really need it but man it adds so much so much uh, it would adds a whole star to the film if you ask me and that's where the daughter goes back and she wanders and something triggers a memory that she used to have from her past and she goes back and starts to relive something and, and visits the apartment and that whole scene is such a gut-wrenching heartbreaking moment the movie almost takes a next step in quality and becomes a great horror film great drama but that's dark water it does have the same features as the blu-ray which i covered a few bits ago but it has the ghost rings and water interview with director uh Hideo nakata family terrors interview with author koji sukati um Su, uh, Suzaki, Visualizing Horror, Interview with Cinematographer um, Yanchiro Hayayashi, Archive Interviews with Actor Hitomi um, Kiroki, and Asami Mitsukawa, and Theme uh, Song Artist Shinka Shuga, Original Making of Documentary Trailers and uh, TV Spots. So yeah, anyways, uh, quite, quite the great release of a great movie, a nice upgrade. Well worth it too, because it's a beautiful film. Okay, this next one here is the Weekly Western. So we're going to roll it. Let's go. Why not? Fill your hand, you son of a bitch! Say when. <laughs> I've covered this one on here before, but I've actually never really uh, got a nice edition here. I think I had an import Blu-ray. Originally, I saw this movie on TV, and it always stood with st stood with me, stayed with me forever. And this is The Shootist, directed by Don Siegel, underrated, one of the greatest directors of all time, starring the iconic, legendary John Wayne. And he's surrounded by iconic cameos throughout the entire film. You have uh, Lauren Bacall, Jimmy Stewart, Scatman Crothers. You have so many people, John Carradine in here. You have so many good character actors and just lovely moments. So essentially the shootist opens up with kind of a, this narration. Oh, Ron Howard's in here as well. This narration talking about, you know, that he was, this guy was a great gunfighter. He was a great gunslinger, one of the best of all time. Um, they're using clips from his old movies and kind of as he, he changes. And it's also kind of a love letter to the career of John Wayne. You know, to the, he's playing a legend, and he's a legend in the genre that he helped become legendary in the United States. I mean, as far as film is concerned. So, it, it talks about this, and, and we get to the point modern day. And Wayne's wearing uh, facial hair. Rarely did John Wayne ever have facial hair. 
Um, you know, I can't think of very many movies where he did. Maybe Genghis Khan, that's it, and this one. So essentially, John Wayne, uh, he's moving into this small town to get a second opinion from Jimmy Stewart, who's a doctor, and he comes to find out that he's got a he's got a cancer, a bad one. Um, two months, maybe six weeks, it's hard to tell. Uh, Jimmy Stewart gives him his classic rundown. It's great seeing them reunite because they were in The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance together. Great movie again. And uh, seeing them interact again was, was great. Um, and every moment John Wayne interacts with one of these legends, it seems special. Especially when he talks to Scatman Crothers, it's just a lovely moment. It's just a, such a cool moment, the bargaining, and he's like, you're the second honest man. It's just great stuff. Um, and John Carradine, of course, is the, the the grave digger. I mean, it's so on the nose, but who else would you have as the as the, the uh, mortician, you know, the, the grave guy? It's got to be John Carradine. But uh, Wayne realizes he's dying. And instead of just withering away and dying of a really painful cancer, you can see that he's going to try something else. And kind of a love blossoms between Lauren Bacall, who he's staying with, and he starts to take Ron Howard under his wing, who's Lauren Bacall's son. Lauren Bacall's also an excellent actress. She's in The Fan from 81, which I just recently talked about. And Ron Howard, this is before he's a director, he's just a young kid. Um, kind of weirdly cast, but he fits perfectly. John Wayne starts to kind of show him and become this fatherly figure, become this kind of almost romantic interest for Lauren Bacall. Nothing sexual. Um, and Wayne's just excellent in this movie. He has this kind of demeanor and this this kind of outlook on life. I don't raise my hand at anybody, and you really like him. His screen presence is great. Some of the best acting. Um, just an old man afraid of the dark, or a dying man afraid of the dark is one of my all-time favorite lines that he has in this, and his delivery um, brings a tear to my eye every time. John Wayne, in real life, they believe, knew he had cancer at this time, 76, 77, they're making this. He died, what, 79, 80? So we're looking at that, right? And John Wayne knowing that this was kind of his swan song. And... He put a lot into it. Don Siegel put a lot into it. Don Siegel never, ever worked with John Wayne before this. He was, you know, Eastwood was his guy. And Eastwood and Wayne were not the same kind of uh, characters. He, Wayne was a hero, and, and Clint Eastwood was an anti-hero. And a little bit of that anti-hero kind of Don Siegel um, is in here. And, and, and Wayne's character is a little bit of that. But the end shootout's great. Um, it's not an action-packed western with a bunch of shooting. There's a couple scenes in the, here and there sprinkled throughout, but it builds up to this shootout in a saloon. Um, and the way it's done is great. Um, and it's just overall excellent. Uh, I love I love John. I'm a big John Wayne fan. I know a lot of people get hung up on his politics and they get mad about it. As far as an actor's concerned, I'll just say it at this. I, I, I mean, he's excellent. I, I've always loved him. His screen presence is is amazing, and everybody in here is top notch. I, it's hard for me to find a negative about this. It's one of my favorite western films. I think it's a, a truly uh, touching and uh, moving one, and I think it looks great in Blu-ray. I, I have not seen it in a long time, and I remembered a lot of the details, a lot of the you know funny lines Wayne's got and sentimental lines and everything like that. Um, as far as the features are concerned, we have. Um, brand new audio commentary by film critic Howard S. Berger. Last day, a new visual essay by David Carnes. A man-making moment, a new interview with Western author C. Courtney Joyner. Laments of the West, a new appreciation of Elmer Bernstein's score by film historian and composer Neil Brand. Contemplating John Wayne, the death of a cowboy. New visual essay by filmmaker and critic Scott Tafonia. The Shootist, The Legend Lives On, archival featurette. So we got a bunch of stuff in here. Um, looks pretty good. I, I do like the cover art here. You got Jimmy Stewart on there, Don Siegel. Um, Again, Don Siegel got Clint Eastwood his start along with, uh, of course, Sergio Leone. And he got uh, Sam Peckinpah his start. So, I mean, Don Siegel is one of the guys. I mean, from Dirty Harry to Escape from Alcatraz to the Shootist to uh, Invasion of the Fucking Body Snatchers. One of the greats to do it. But uh, The Shootist, underrated movie, produced by Dino De Laurentiis. And I know people... A lot of people laugh at Golem and Globus and Dino De Laurentiis, and they're like, oh, they're crazy producers. But some of the stuff that they produced, no one else would have done. And, and the movies they've touched and put out, some of them are stone-cold classics. So laugh all you want. You never produced a stone-cold classic. But anyways, the shootest. Deserves got nothing to do with it. When you have to shoot, shoot. Don't talk. Okay, next up is from Severn Video, and this is Dracula, Prisoner of Frankenstein, directed by 
Jesus Franco. That's right, Jess Franco. Uh, so this one is one that I've never seen. I know that he did Erotic Nights of Erotic Rites of Frankenstein as well, and he has a million vampire films. First thing I noticed popping this bad boy on this is 72. His film Count Dracula was 1970. Had the score by Bruno Nicolotti or Nicolotti. And the scores are really close. I was like, I've seen Count Dracula uh, a bunch of times. It's one of my favorite Franco films. And I was like, man, that score sounds just like Count Dracula. And uh, listening to it, same composer. I wonder if there's some reuses or anything like that. But Dracula, Prisoner of Frankenstein. So I was watching this and I was like, this is kind of inept. So what we have is Howard Vernon as Dracula, who is a great Dracula. I mean, he looks the part. He's excellent. But he's kind of doing a weird puppet thing, which is funny. And he dies right in the beginning. I was like, kind of like, is there a Dracula going to be the prisoner of Frankenstein? He's dead already. So anyways, enter Dennis Price, classic actor here. He pops up in a couple other Dennis. Uh, he's in a Hammer, I believe, and he's in some other Jess Franco films. He, he comes in, and he's... Dr. Frankenstein. So he ends up resurrecting Dracula, keeping him in his, like, kind of, like, in his, whatever. He figures out that these monsters that he creates and whatnot, he creates a monster, Frankenstein monster and Dracula. They're under his control. He's trying to start some sort of army to take out things. There's also female vampires running around. And at the very end, a werewolf runs in. He's like, and, he, and we have a Frankenstein versus the Wolfman fight again. Um, so this one is essentially kind of strange because I'm watching it. It's like, this is inept and silly. And there's a lot of like, just it's slow. It's very slow. It's not my favorite Franco. I will say this. It's not my favorite Franco at all. It's kind of mediocre in the world of Franco. It has some decent atmosphere. It has good music because it's probably reused from Count Dracula, um, or B sides or something like that. And it, the effects are okay. I mean, Howard Vernon's cool in it. I love seeing Howard Vernon. Um, Dennis Price is fine. But at the end of the day, this is not the strongest Franco film. It's kind of mediocre. It's nice that they remastered it, and I finally can watch this on a nice edition because I had never seen the thing. But uh, the special features did make me feel better. We have Prisoner of Franco Stein, interview with uh, author Stephen Thrower, author of Murderous Passions, Delirious Cinema of Jess Franco. And I love that because he talks for 42 minutes. And I'm like, okay, what's Stephen Thor going to say to make me appreciate this more, to make me understand more? And he's like, it's a bit inept. And he starts going on. He's like, it's kind of silly, very funny. I was like, okay, so he's gathering his comedy from it and everything like that. And Stephen Thor is like the biggest uh, lover of Jess Franco films. And he like he seems to enjoy this one as its weirdness. But, you know, I didn't feel as bad feeling a little, little low on this one in comparison to some of his other things like Vampiros Lesbos or She Killed in Ecstasy or Venus in Furs or Count Dracula. Like, those movies or bloody moon those movies are really good and then watching this i was like this is not what i wanted to see in a franco film or even the awful dr orloff i mean franco's got a lot of great films i know people just talk, talk shit about franco but man he's got a lot of good films he doesn't have all the great films but he's made a lot and a lot of them are good but there's also in the land of franco on here in the spanish opening and deleted scene from english language version overall it's short it's not that sweet. I can't give it a wholehearted recommend, but it's Dracula, Prisoner of Frankenstein for, for Franco completist and Euro cult completist only, I'd say. But still cool. Nice release, though, for sure. Um, I mean, how many more movies are you going to see with a with a Dracula, a Frankenstein monster, and a wolfman, and some vampire women? So, uh, not many. Not many. Next up from Air 4444 is another Cat 3 classic from Hong Kong from the early 90s, directed by Billy Tang, who did Red to Kill. Um, great movie, and I think Brother of Darkness. So this is Run and Kill. Yeah, not to be confused with Red and Kill. Not to be confused with Love to Kill. So yeah, a lot of Hong Kong stuff here. So um, I re I just saw this for the first time, believe it or not. this I heard it was on Kablu. I had a DVD for years. And then I heard it was coming on Blu-ray, so I decided to wait. And uh, I was pretty hyped because this movie has a good reputation of being absolutely batshit crazy. Cat 3 movie. Also has a commentary by my friends Bruce Holchek and Art Editor, who are on the show, or the, the, the channel frequently. So I was really happy to see this get a release from Air 444. I'm glad they're doing this stuff. They do have Red to Kill coming here as well. So essentially what we have here is... Um, the lead actor here, I can't think of his name. He's the big guy from The Beast. He's in um, Mob Flicks uh, Patrol. He's in um, Murderers, Pursuers. He's in everything. He's in every Hong Kong movie you've ever heard of. And he's great. He's a star in this. And one day, he just he works really hard. He loves his beautiful wife. One day, he comes home and she's cheating on him. He's very upset. He's very cowardly, but he leaves and he kind of just starts overeating. He sees an old friend. He says, hey, man, come to the bar with me. He gets really drunk and he runs into this girl and this girl says, you should really pay them back. They should pay. You know, they should suffer for what they did to you. That is wrong. She starts to get a little tipsy. She contacts a group of criminals and 
And in the stupor, he says something, um, big guy says something he shouldn't, and he accidentally triggers a chain of events where these assassins come in and completely murder his wife and the lover. He gets hurt in the process. He doesn't really know what's going on. Um, he tries to go back on it and, and turn them in because he's confused by the entire situation. A cop is Danny Lee in here, of course, from Untold Story and a million other great films. Um, the um, killer as well but uh so so he's confused and what happens is this pisses the gang off and the gang comes at him full force they want to take all his assets and everything like that now when he's trying to escape to a summer home that's not been used he runs into another gang and this gang says hey we're going to protect you and give us whatever so he starts pitting these gangs against each other unintentionally and there's like a bloody war lots of people are killed until eventually um at least one person and the big guy left. And uh, the title, Run to Kill, is, uh, I be- I would say it's basically an amazing scene where the big guy has this guy. Because there's a lot of tragedy that ensues. A lot of people are killed that you don't think are going to get killed in the most brutal fashion you can imagine. It's Cat 3, it's Hong Kong, it's the 90s, it's going to get crazy. It's going to get fucking crazy. So, big guy is grabbing this guy, and they're just running through the warehouse. Boom, boom, going through all this stuff, and he's just screaming his heart out. I was just like, that's an amazing scene. And actually, this big guy is got to be up there with Sammo Hong and Chow Young Fat. It's just like one of the best Hong Kong actors I've ever seen. I just love this guy. And he's a chameleon. He changes with his facial hair, his attitude, his demeanor. Um, this release right here is awesome. It looks amazing. It sounds amazing. The commentary by Bruce and Art is great as well. They mention that they don't really see this as a dark comedy as some people do. And it has a lot less comedy than you would expect from comparison to like a lot of the other Cat 3 or Hong Kong films. Like on Told Story has these funny moments. And like they use so much of the same cast. Like everybody in here appears in all these different movies. Oh, did Billy Tang also did Dr. Lamb or he was involved with Dr. Lamb. But uh, yeah, the special features include brand new restoration, audio commentary, Bruce Holchek. Um... And Art Editor, The Kids Aren't Alright, video essay by Erica Soltz. That's fun because it's a whole thing about Hong Kong movies and where children are in peril and a bunch of other stuff like that. Very interesting. Audio commentary by Kenneth uh, Bordeson and Philip Gergen of Podcast on Fire Network, Run and Kill, uh, CFX on Location. That's great because it's a guy on location and it's filmed beautifully. Guy did a really good job. New English, tra- uh, traditional Mandarin and simplified uh, Mandarin subtitles. This is the kind of stuff I want to see on Blu-ray more than anything else. I'm super happy to have this on blu-ray can't wait for red to kill can't wait for their other stuff they got coming out i love the hong kong movies man i'm so glad they're getting these nice releases finally there's so many more too there's so many more that i've never seen that people don't even know never had good releases so let's do it let's get all these out man i'll buy them all all right next up from 1971 is another don siegel joint and this is the beguiled starring Clint Eastwood. And you know what? Um, I had never seen this in its entirety. So I'll be brief with it, um, but to be guiled. So uh, Clint Eastwood is a Union soldier, and he gets injured. In the very beginning, a young girl finds him, and right off the bat, Clint Eastwood's into manipulating because he's in Southern Territory. This young girl, he's like, how old are you? She's like 12. He's like, not too old, not too young for a kiss. And he gives her a kiss. You're like, oh man, we're getting into some crazy stuff. So they take him to this woman's house, basically. It's a small like boarding school where there's six uh, young girls being taught uh, proper etiquette and stuff like that. During the war, there's a teacher, there is uh, a slave there, and then there's a headmaster. And uh, Ger- Geraldine Page. Geraldine Page, sorry about that. And uh, essentially... Clint Eastwood, as he's injured, he starts to work his magic and kind of starts to bring up conversations and stuff, and he starts to get them all somewhat interested in him. Obviously, that he's the only guy that they've seen in a long time, and he's painting this facade to each one of them as a different kind of person uh, than who he really is. And it's Clint Eastwood, man. He's suave. He's slick. A uh, very good performance by Clint Eastwood. A very different performance. A performance that puts him in a lot of people say, like, look at James Conn in Misery, man. He just a big masculine guy putting himself up there like that and showing some vulnerability and that's very impressive you know but Clint Eastwood is doing it he's on this thing he shows a lot of um, vulnerability and he was never afraid to do that and I think that that's what made him kind of a special kind of actor he's an anti-hero he's a guy who will show his he'll do something dirty he'll do something shitty he'll show some vulnerability he'll do take these chances like uh, tightrope where he says that line about being homosexual uh, not saying he's gay but he says how do you know I haven't you know and you're like whoa and and the scene in Unforgiven 
when he, after he shoots the guy, you know, it's just subversing the Western so well that he's so upset with himself. He's so uncomfortable with what he's done. And he's just looking down, picking at the rocks because he doesn't want to look up because he doesn't want to face what he's done. He just makes these choices that a lot of other action stars or these masculine macho men wouldn't do. And he does it in Beguile too. And he, and towards the end of the film, it gets really tragic in a lot of ways. And, and the thing is, it's pretty interesting because we get all these inner monologues or narration from the women, but not from Eastwood. I mean, it's it's the women's picture in a lot of ways. They're in control, and they start to be manipulated, but at the end of the day, you see what happens. Um, this is a good film. Really well made. The other only actor I've seen pop up as far as males is concerned that I recognize was Matt Clark, uh, character actor. He's in, like, White Lightning and a million other movies. Uh, Will Penny. He's in a lot of films. The Return to Oz. So, I mean, he's, he's fine in it. But he doesn't get enough to do. But everybody's really solid in this. Really enjoyed this. Really interesting kind of look at, at, you know, this movie here. And just how it's done. And he's tied in this bed, and he's he's desperate, but he's also manipulative. So, uh, and, and just he's, the speech at the end when he gets the upper hand. A lot of stuff in here. Really interesting, well done movie. Loved it. Uh, Beguiled. Uh, interesting more than great, but still just as great. You know what I mean? It's, what makes a great movie great is that it's interesting to watch in a lot of ways and entertaining. So it's both. All right, let's get into those 1981 movies. Woe be unto him who opens one of the seven gateways to hell. Because through that gateway, evil will invade the world. Time ago, 
and no one will know as the years come and go of the horror from long time ago. All right, first up is going to be Caligula and Messalina. That's right, from Bruno Mattei, or Bruno Mattei, 1981 Caligula movie. So 79 had the big Caligula movie with Malcolm McDowell, and um, who, who was in that? Helen Mirren, and uh, geez, uh, who was the actor who got kind of, it was, um, geez, why am I forgetting this actor? He's like, swim little Peter O'Toole. So yeah, so okay, we got Caligula in 79, and then basically after that we had this one, and there's some rip-offs. We have Caligula and Messaline in 81. 82, we have Caligula, the untold story, Joe D'Amato. So this is essentially kind of the retelling of Caligula, right? And Caligula was a guy who ruled for like two years. He had a really gross reign. He was very violent. He put his horse as a senator. He was a rapist, monster. But then again, as the special features say, who writes history? They're going to make him look worse because they're taking over. Hey, look how much better I am than Caligula. So essentially what we have here is Caligula. Is sleeping with his siblings, his sisters, and everything like that. And we have a lot of debauchery. And what happens is he just kind of rules the kingdom with an iron fist. Uh, people think he's traitoring them, so he tortures them and kills them. Overall, there's not that much to talk about in this. It's entertaining for what it is. Um, the acting is decent. Um, it's sleazy. There's a lot of sex in it. I mean, it's pretty softcore. Maybe more even more than that. I watched the hardcore version. There's two versions on here. So it's hardcore if you watch that version. Overall, I do not have much to say about Caligula. I'm getting towards the end of the 81 movies. I'll probably have one big heavy hitter after this, which is going to be a special video. And then like one other one that's not in this video that I'll watch if I can. There's a couple I couldn't find. I'll talk about that next week as well well but as far as the special features are concerned we have Caligula the life behind the legend interview with Anthony A. Barrett um, author of Caligula the corruption of power and this guy's like an expert on Caligula he's not some you know exploitation expert he's an expert on the history of Caligula so that was very interesting to see him talk about it see what's fantasy or whatever overall this movie is okay um, and halfway through Caligula bites it and we have Messalina take over and whatnot or try to take over. Uh, just sleazy, good time by Bruno Mattei. Um, bigger budget than you'd expect, I mean, for a Bruno Mattei film. But then again, you know, he had some that had some decent budget. I mean, the same year he also did The Other Hell, which is a pretty solid non-splitation movie. So, I mean, Bruno had a good year in 80, 81. Okay, next up is a Bollywood movie. And um, I'm just going to call it by its American name, The Sacred Golden Chain. And this is actually a DVD. I didn't know they had a DVD, or I would have had it a long time ago. So it does have English subtitles. It's, it did skip at one point, so there's that. But uh, yeah, so basically this is kind of an exorcist deal. This was a remake, if I'm not mistaken. There was a movie made in 79. Am I right about that? And then they remade it in 81. I don't know why, but this is kind of a rip of The Exorcist. So there is a couple musical numbers in here. Um, it's about two hours and 19 minutes. There's a couple musical numbers in the film, but not as many as you'd think. So essentially it follows two lovers who are about to get married. Uh, it seems like there's always somebody about to get married. The Dr. Jekyll story was like that too from 81, the Holly, the Bollywood movie. So they're about to get married and some weird things start to happen. You know, like a horse runs ran crazy and almost somebody gets really hurt. And then, uh, we find out that this guy, um, the lead guy is an atheist and it's like, oh shit, that could be it. But there's more to the story than that. Um, there's a huge comedic element in here, like the cooks and one of the guys that runs us like a place. They're just so ridiculously stupid. This stuff takes like 30, 40 minutes of the movie and it should really be cut out. Uh, like I said, the Bollywood stuff, the comedy in the movie Hotel from this year from 81, I enjoyed. This one I didn't. It's really stupid food stuff. Um, just overall really drags the film down to a snail's pace. Considering the fact it's an exorcist ripoff, we know exactly what's going to happen. So essentially we do figure out that this guy had had like a hex put on him and there was a character, in his, somebody from his past that did it. And when he actually is possessed, we like see this shadow come over him and he's like, ah, and like you see the woman there and he's talking and he has these bright blue eyes and he's like, eh. It's not really gory. It's not particularly violent. It's not particularly scary. Um, it's okay. Um, I like the idea that the power of song and an emblem, uh, basically this woman is singing at the end to, to save her for her fiance. Overall, this movie is okay. There's too much. It's way too long for what it is. I'm not the biggest fan of Exorcist films in the first place. 
I love The Exorcist and a couple other ones, but for as far as like these types of possession movies are concerned, they are usually very lackluster, especially when they're drawn out to two hours and 19 minutes, and a lot of that is musical numbers and really poor comedy that doesn't really fit the tone of the rest of the movie. Um, I do like the flashback with the lady from his, his past life. I think that's the best stuff. I think everything that happens with her is great. Um, but besides that, I think it's a kind of a mediocre Bollywood movie that's way too long. I would prefer Hotel or even the Dr. Jekyll from this year, to be honest, from 81. Okay, I'm going to be brief with these 1981 movies because a lot of them aren't really horror films. And I watched them early in the week. First one up, cult classic. Somebody put it on Letterboxd for a hot minute as a horror film. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to do it. It's a cult movie. I'm going to do it. Mommy Dearest. Starring Faye Dunaway as Joan Crawford. That's right. This is an infamous story. This is like a huge cult film that is considered campy or a little weird. And, and people love it. People parody it. They do all sorts of things to it. So I popped this in and I had never seen it before. And I got to say, I enjoyed it. I mean, it's a good, nice kind of like life of the daughter of Joan Crawford. So essentially what she does is she adopts this young kid, these two kids, a, a girl and a boy. And she puts this girl's life through hell. And at times there seems to be love. We see her at her richest at her throwing these grand birthday parties but there's this hint of cruelty this hint of not her not being good enough for it the entire time and there's a character in here that used to date Joan Crawford and he's the attorney or her agent and I love this guy's performance he's got this kind of old Hollywood kind of thing going on and I think that his voice is great and I think that his delivery is great and his exit from the film I think is probably one of my favorite exits I've ever seen in a film Good night, good luck, and goodbye. That's just a heartbreaking uh, exit from a film. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I love that kind of fight back between those two. Uh, Faye Dunaway is fucking excellent. She's a monster. But also garners some sympathy. Um, overall, I think this is a really good film. Um, there's just so many of these points where you can't believe what's going to happen next. E all the way to the ending is like, is this what she's doing now? She's stealing her fucking TV role. Is this what she's giving her give away her presence now? She's locking just all sorts of abuses that are crazy. I mean, like flowers in the attic is like the extreme version of this. This is supposedly a true story though, you know, but, uh, overall I think mommy dearest is well worth it. Um, really well acted, very entertaining. Like it's a longer film, but it never wears out. It's welcome. You never are kept checking the time. It's, it's a very good movie. It's a very, good biopic i guess how much is fictionalized who knows you really feel sorry for the daughter um at the very end you see them grown up and the uh the son is actually played by xander berkeley which is cool he's a character actor and a bunch of stuff but so overall uh, i mean faye dunaway steals the show great stuff uh mommy dearest okay next up is a tv movie uh thriller called tear among us lots of tv movies this year tons and tons of them but uh tear among us here we go essentially this story about basically five flight attendants that uh the, the whole big thing ends up with a, a convicted rapist kind of trapping them in the apartment is the big climax of the film. But we follow this loser of a rapist guy who's been released and Don Meredith is this police officer and we follow his also his parole officer is this like kind of like very very uh, you know liberal but very good natured human being that uh, and then we have Don Meredith who he thinks like going to be this ultra conservative guy and you're like is this going to be like just like uh, like you know, one of those movies that's like, you just basically like a conservative's wet dream. Like, this is how it is. But it doesn't. It gets to the very end of the movie and it's just like, it it compromises, kind of, in the middle. And it says, this system's fucked, let's fix it together. And you're like, oh, it's definitely a TV movie. It's definitely playing it safe. It's definitely not going to be crazy one way or the other it, anyways. But essentially what we have here, in the very beginning, we kind of realize that this, this kind of like former rapist is just no good. He's got a lot of convictions. He gets in trouble for doing something that he got was it was MO before. And these cops and Don Meredith, uh, TV actor, sports announcer, analyst, player, um, and this, this social worker butt heads. But we kind of see that where this is going and he keeps kind of interacting this rapist with these five flight attendants and it's going to escalate until kind of a tragic moment at the very end. doesn't really show anything, but it implies a lot of disturbing stuff. Overall, this is a good TV movie. looks great too. There's an HD print floating around. Overall, Tear Among Us is solid. Solid TV film. Would recommend if you like TV thrillers. It's not really a horror film, but the ending could probably push it over a little bit for some people, but I enjoyed it myself. There is a small role by Ken Forey in here, which I saw in prison he's like i loved it so it was really cool to see him pop up in here love that stuff 
Okay, the last one from 81 is a Hong Kong flick called The Mad Cold-Blooded Killer. There's two versions of this movie. I think one's like an hour and 30 and one's like an hour and 17. I watched the hour and 17 minute version with crappy subtitles. And I'm not going to lie, I was lost. I watched the bad version. I do not know what the fuck this is seen as a horror film. This one has some memorable faces in it. Some people in here that I recognize. It's supposed to have Bolo Young in it. I didn't see Bolo Young, so I watched a super fucking short version, a shit version. So I don't know what's going on. So anyways, uh, what we have here is this guy who whose wife or girlfriend is a, is possibly a prostitute. They have a kid together. She goes out and sleeps around, and he completely loses his mind from it and becomes a serial killer. There's a couple scenes that basically do seem to be from a horror movie, but for the most part, it's kind of cops trying to catch this guy. Overall, this is not a great film. I would stick with Terror Among Us if you're looking for a guy, cops trying to catch a killer. But no, it's just not as good as the other Hong Kong stuff in the same vein, but I saw a really short, crappy version. It's not as good as Mob Flicks Patrol. It's not as good as Man on the Brink. It's not as good as Murder or Pursuers. Um, um, you know, those are all better films. Those are all better made. Those are all more, um, not less inept. But again, like I said, I can't give this a wholehearted recommend because I can't even give you a true review of it because the version I saw was cut to ribbons. I cut two fucking ribbons. But overall, the mad cold-blooded killer from the version I saw is not worth your time. Very short review, but I'm sorry. But that's just all I have for it. It's not great. Okay, basically somebody's Patreon pick was pick the last film from a great director, and I know this director is not technically dead, but I don't think they'll be directing anything else. So I picked a movie from 1990, and this is Frankenstein Unbound. I watched it on the internet. I watched it on Plex because I didn't want to open my old DVD. But yeah, here we go. Never released on Blu-ray, directed by Roger Corman. I love Frankenstein stories, and I had seen parts of this before, but I don't think I ever saw the whole thing. We got John Hurt and Raw Julia. There's somebody else in here, and I'll never forgive myself. Is it like Bridget Fonda? I think it is Bridget. Jason Patrick's in here. Um, Bridget Fonda, that's right. So, yeah, um, I'll never forgive myself if I didn't get it right. So, essentially, it's the future. John Hurt has invented some sort of time machine uh, deal. And what's happening is it's creating these rips where people from different pasts will come in and it'll cause all sorts of chaos. He obviously has his own Frankenstein story going on, right? Be careful what you create, all that kind of stuff. Uh, eventually, he gets pulled into a time warp, and he gets sent back to the times of Victor von Frankenstein. Victor von Frankenstein is played by fucking Ra Julia, one of the greatest actors of his time. Unfortunately, died very young. Um, but he plays Dr. Frankenstein, and he's a cold-hearted son of a bitch in this. He's a cold Dr. Frankenstein. So, essentially, we're kind of right among the mitts. The Frankenstein monster is already loose. He's already running amok. He's a big, scary kind of guy. Very comic book style. Um, could do the Universal, because this is a Columbia or Fox. It's 20th Century Fox. So, he's got the, the his, his like kind of chargers where he gets zapped to life around the side of his head, not the bolts on the neck like the classic Karloff. But, essentially, what we have here is we open it up right to where... Uh, Frankenstein, instead of killing the uh, the young boy, the, um, he killed... No, he does kill his brother, his young brother. Um, and we have the, the servant who's being blamed for it. And, and this one, Dr. Frankenstein, does not give a shit. Well, John Hurt knows the story because Mary Shelley's there and she based it off this and wrote it and all, all these kind of things and wrote a beautiful story. It's kind of strange and weird, kind of slightly meta in a way. But he... Um, he tries to get this person saved, but it, it, to to no to, to no chagrin. But uh, yeah, what happens is it gets crazier and crazier and crazier until eventually, you know, John Hurt does something pretty wild, and we go into the future with Frankenstein's monster. And I really enjoyed that. I thought this was great. It's short. It's straight to the point. It doesn't waste your fucking time. The acting's great. John Hurt's a great actor. Draw Julia's a good actor. And the Frankenstein monster is a unique portrayal of the monster. He's big and he's scary and he's he's dumb, but he's dumb in a way that he's completely learning all the time and I like that like he's like naive but also intelligent like he's learning and I think that that was a portrayal that I necessarily hadn't seen well you see Karloff and he's he's plays it ooh, ooh, at first and he starts talking um, and then you see De Niro who plays him more true to the book where he's like he gets he's learning and he starts off really dumb but he gets really smart really fast and, and, and the Frankenstein monster was created you know to be agile and fast and everything great so like he's learning in this and seeing him learn and kind of cope and um, go with things is pretty pretty interesting but this is a cool take on the frankenstein story a futuristic kind of time jumping frankenstein story pretty cool i guess the only one that does that time jumping thing in a frankenstein story would be waxwork 2 i mean uh yeah I, and that's kind of just lost in time but that's cool but regardless i really like this frankenstein unbound i would recommend it good stuff for sure all right getting these questions comments concerns 
Subjective Perspective Collective. Man, I know this might be a hot take, but Roar is my all-time favorite animals attacks film next to the birds, both with Trippy Hedburn. Uh, Hedron, sorry. It's Hedburn, Mitch Hedburn. It's insane, uh, the legit fear you feel for this family. Always killing it with your reviews, brother. Look forward to these every Tuesday. Thank you. Fat Pig Conqueror. Great video, Dave. Did you see the owner of Aquarius releasing? Terry Levine died back in January at the age of 90. I did. R.I.P. Seemed like a really cool guy. I love that the idea that he had. He used to be a boxer, so he keep a boxing and weights and stuff in his, uh, in his uh, office. If I had an office, that's definitely what I would do. Hudson3838, if you're struggling with French language, you should try Welsh. And he puts some Welsh there, and I'm just like, what the fuck is that? Plank is a is like, Lawen Falgen, no, I'm not doing it, is a Welsh word that translates roughly to as St. Mary's Church in the hollow of the White Hazel near a rapid whirlpool in the Church of St. Talisdo near the Red Cave. Here's an easy one. Nos da means good night. That is good. No sta indeed, Hudson. The Nick Mool from Belgium. Jamie Blank's Valentine might not win you over at first, but on repeated viewings, we'll change that. This release is filled to the brim with extra goodies, everything you would ever want to know or not. It's on the disc. Also, there aren't that many Valentine Day themed slashers, right? You got Hospital Massacre. You got My Bloody Valentine, both from 81. So there's two. Uh, David Hemmings, uh, doesn't Pieces open with that too? David Hemmings, no matter what decade he acted in, his performance was always excellent. I'm so grateful for the magic of Blu-ray so his body of work can always and forever be enjoyed. Questions. What's your favorite David Hemmings performance? Um, He's great in Deep Red. He's great in Blow Up. But let's go with his Dr. Jekyll from 1980. Mr. Hyde's very good. But um, it's only a game, right, Mama? What's that one that Mondo Macabre put out? He's great at that. He's like this weird man-child. That's a great performance too. So... That or the Dr. Jekyll. You seem to enjoy the Amityville franchise. Will you be acquiring 88 Films' new 4K release of the original? It comes with the Kim Newman commentary. I already have the Vinegar Syndrome 4K, so I probably won't double dip for just a commentary, unfortunately. Your Braille or Ground episode knocked it out of the park and straight into a zombie skull. Again. Equal parts informative and entertaining. Dare I say, indutainment? Okay. Till next time, take care. You too. Stoked Scab 1. I actually love Val Kilmer Island, the Dr. Mabro. I remember seeing it in the theaters when I was a kid, and me and my buddy were the only ones in the theater. I mean, I, I, I remember we didn't love it when it came out, me and my family, but I've grown to kind of have appreciation for it. I definitely will rewatch it. Um, MJ8709. The Tavar- the Tavani brothers are some of the best and my favorite directors ever. I think you'd really love a lot of their other films, too. And they directed Al Lasant, uh, how you say it? Z- uh, Zami Adams. Roar is such an amazing film. I'm going to check out Burial Ground today. Great episode. Thank you. Ken Coakley. I owe Blow Up on I own Blow Up on Blu-ray. When I first watched the film, I watched it because one of my favorite rock bands, The Yarnburns, were in it. I also noticed that Mike Myers parodied one of the scenes in the Austin Powers films when he photographs women. He yells, show me love, baby. Yeah. David Hemmings had a fairly impressive body of work. Two years after Blow Up, he was in Barbarella with John Philip Law, then worked again with Law in The Love Machine. Machine. We also know about Hemmings having done Deep Red with Dario Argento. He was in Camelot with a singing Franco Nero and Heroin Busters with Fabio Testi. Heroin Busters is a good one. Regarding the review of Roar, you mentioned a fear of elephants. I'm not too fear afraid of elephants. I'm more afraid of big cats. I read in the article that elephants think of humans as being cute, just like we think of cats and dogs as being cute. Now for my favorite uh, of the movies you reviewed this week, Burial Ground. I actually liked the zombie makeup for the freshly dead people. It was similar to the zombie makeup in Dawn of the Dead. I also grimace when I see the maid being decapitated with a reaping tool. Peter Burke was creepy as, zo- as the zombies. He looks like the guy with thick glasses on Trailer Park Boys. Rumor has it that Peter Burke was a little boy in the Karloff segment in Mario Bava's Black Sabbath. I really want to get out of the nursing home so I can get a 4K TV and 4K player so I can watch Burial Ground as well as Demons 1, 2, Dawn of the Dead, and others in 4K. I'm rooting for you, man. How can we help you get out of there? Let us know. And then we got, uh, yeah, I got one little movie to update uh, before we get out of here. And that is a 4K of War of the Worlds, the original. Ten bucks, couldn't pass it up. Watch this bad boy in style now in 4K. Dolby uh, Vision, DTS HD. Yeah, good stuff. Um, anyways, guys, yeah, let's get out of here. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a good one. Bye.